Let's bring the 31st Masters of Pediatric Dermatology back into session. We have a wonderful uh, next uh, five talks, mainly focused on dermatological care for adolescent patients. Our lead off hitter is one of my favorite former residents and an outstanding faculty now at the University of Miami. It's Dr. Jeanette Kirai, uh, who did her dermatology residency with us and uh, became director of uh, a vast VA service in dermatology. She's had a career focus on acne and rosacea, but also in patient advocacy, especially for marginated populations and in the area of integrative dermatology. She's going to speak on this session, Therapeutic Update, What's Approved for Teens with Acne? Please welcome Dr. Jeanette Kirai. Thank you, Dr. Shackman. Thanks to my residents, for, for our, our residents, I should say. Um, every t year, Dr. Shackner asks me to do a, a talk at the Masters, and he, he comes up with a title, right? So he came up with this title, and I'm like, what am I going to talk about? So um, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's new with teenagers with acne? And he challenged me. So I found some new things, and we'll go over some things that may not be as new for some of you. But when we talk about teenagers with acne, and these are just my disclosures, and this is sort of the outline that we're going to follow, um, we have to talk about adherence, right? So if you look at one study, this is a little bit old, maybe about five, six years old, and they looked at a university outpatient setting. They looked at kids who had acne. And they looked at whether or not they used their treatments. And everybody knows my clinic that I talk a lot, and I'm spending all this time talking about the patients. But about 27% of patients didn't fill their prescription medications. So I'm, I'm there talking, and you know I'm just going on and on. And if you give them, and, and I appreciate the laughter because that's true, but if you give them one, two, or three, you can look at the percentage. If you gave them one medicine, 9% weren't filled. If you gave them two, it's 40, and if he's three, it went down to 31%. And I'm thinking, well, if they're really bad, you're probably giving them three medications, so that's why it went down a little bit. So we don't have a lot of adherence, and when we think about teenagers, we have to think, how can we interact with them in a way so that they want to take care of their skin? Um, and if you look a little bit, if you give them a topical retinoid, look at the, um, the, the most non-adherence was associated with the topical retinoid. We all give a topical retinoid. And look at the second thing, an over-the-counter product. I'm always giving over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide. So as I was creating this lecture, I was thinking, you know, I have so much to learn. I've been doing this for over 25 years, and yet I still have so much to learn because the two things associated with non-adherence are the things I do in my clinic all the time, a topical retinoid and usually an over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide wash. So it got me thinking a little bit. Um, in this study, and, and a different, another study, electronic records are good, so those things that sort of drive me crazy with the Epic uh, medical record actually are helpful because adherence goes way up when you have electronic medical records and you send the prescription in that way. It's also better if you only give them one thing. Who's been in my clinic when I gave one thing? All right, so because I never give one thing, right? So that's probably where I could do better. Um, yesterday I gave one thing, um, and no one was in the room with me to see it, but, <laughs> but it's totally true. I gave one to a young man who was 15. Um, so some patients may not complete the acne treatment regimen because they never got the medicines. How many times do we have that happen in acne patients? They come in and then we say, you know, show me what you're using. Oh, I never got that one. Oh, I never got that one. And it's a it's a little bit exhausting, right? Because you're trying and you're trying and they're not even getting the medicines, whether it be cost, whether it be availability, um, whether it be they got it and they didn't want to use it. And sometimes we all see this, the parents care more about the kid's acne than the kids do. And that, that also is a barrier we have to go through. But if you look at the whole pediatric population and you look at adolescents versus the other members of the pediatric community, adolescents are more motivated. They're more motivated than kids who have acne or under the age of, let's say, 11 or 12. So adolescents want to look better, and we have to keep that in mind. If you looked at adolescents specifically, they were about two times more likely to get their medicine, and 2.4 um, to, to get it refilled and then to get it. So they'll get it, and they'll get it refilled. So they're using it. So let's, 
let's sort of cater to these guys. Now, as far as which medications you can use, this is a fantastic reference. I would ask you guys if you want a reference of all of the medications, and this is by the Daughters Eichenfeld and Dr. Sprague. Um, if you want a listing, just a nice table. I love tables, they're easy to read. This has all the current um, acne treatments that you can use in the United States. So you can keep that and then you can pull one out of your back pocket sometimes if you're a little bit stuck. I didn't repeat them here because they're in the reference. But what are the newer ones? And I'll go through, th through them rather quickly. We have Clascoderone, which is that topical antiandrogen. We're talking about ages here, 12 years and above, and males and females. A lot of people think Clascoderone is only for women, but it's actually for women and men, or for, for females and males. And this is just a quick schematic on how class codorone works. That big purple ball is DHT, the testosterone. The little um, cup-shaped blue is the androgen receptor. And a little blue ball is your class codorone blocking that mechanism. A newer retinoid, and again, we're just going to go through some of the newer agents very quickly. Uh, triferritine is our new uh, retinoid topically. It's a 0.0005 cream. It can be used on the face and the trunk. Um, it's nine years and up, so we can use this in adolescence. The um, thing about this, it, can, it seems to kick in pretty quickly. Uh, the, some of the original data from some of the studies I'm going to show you in the next slide, but it kicks in a little quickly. So when the patient comes in and says they want something fast, um, sometimes I'll pull this out of my back pocket. Um, side effect profiles similar to other retinoids, but sometimes people want something different and you need to be able to pull something out that they haven't seen. Now again, cost is always an issue, so when you have a newer product, you have to keep that in mind as well. And these are just the slides. If I can have you look down at the red and the blue on each of these graphs, but particularly the top two, you'll start to see them separate rather early in the one, two, three week time. Sericycline is our newest antibiotic for um, acne. Um, why do we like it? It's narrow spectrum. Uh, it was developed in a weight-based way of dosing, so about 1.5 milligrams per kilogram a day. Again, you can use this in, in um, adolescence. These are the doses. So in my clinic sometimes, I'm, I have memorized a lot in my life. So I'll ask the resident, what's the weight? Calculate the weight. What's the dose? I want them to get into the habit so they can be efficient providers when they go out there. Shouldn't have to calculate this. Go right in your head, figure it out, your kilograms, and pick your dosing. Um, again, not many side effects, a little bit of candidiasis, a little nausea. These are the sericycline photos from some of the original trials. Um, if you look probably at the bottom, you'll see probably some of the best photos of improvement with this oral antibiotic. Minocycline foam, this was developed to help decrease resistance. Um, we know that antibiotic resistance or antibacterial resistance is um, a concern not only of dermatologists, but of the medical community, the world. The world is concerned about antibiotic resistance. Um, so minocycline phone was developed because of the resistance associated with oral minocycline. And you can see that there's such a much lower level of minocycline that is affecting the body when you have a topical. It is a foam and it is flammable, so you have to keep, keep, uh, keep that in mind. The thing that makes me happy about minocycline foam is it seems to be effective 52 weeks out. So as far as resistant deve resistance developing in your patient, know that about 52 weeks out, we're still seeing it working. So that's important because that's why it was developed. Again, there's some, some new formulations of old retinoids. I want you to know there's tazeratine, there's tretinoin in different less irritating topicals. Um, again, they used a lotion that was a less of a concentration, but got the same effect as a 0.1, so there's a 0.05 lotion. This is, and these are the pictures of before and after with the topical tazeratine. They also did it with tretinoin. But then now, so I'm looking and I'm thinking, what have I heard in the last year? And we talked about products that can help acne for teenagers, for an adolescent, and this is what's on the horizon. Um, I don't, it's not out yet, it's a triple. So it has clindamycin, benzoyl peroxide, and adapalene. Um, the data is good. Um, nothing is a cure-all, guys. So nothing is 100%. But if you look at the data, and this is um, one of the studies that's at week 12, you'll see that about over 50% of the patients were doing better versus placebo. And then they did interesting arms in the study. They gave them either um, they gave half two of the three components to compare against, so they could see if the one component was doing all the work. 
you know, was it the benzoyl peroxide or was it the adapalene? So this is sort of the triple threat that's coming, and this was looked at in adolescent populations. So it's coming, I'm not sure. I, I did email the company this morning to see if I could find out when this is, you know, we're gonna be able to use this, and I didn't get any answer back. So combination medicines. And these are the pictures done in a variety of skin types. So spironolactone, one of my residents usually call me about after they graduate. Well, it depends. Um, the, some of the things that they call me about are when can I use spironolactone, at what age? Um, so it's a potent antiandrogen. You don't want to give it to a 12-year-old, right, because they're still developing. The dose I usually use is about 100 milligrams. For me, I usually use a cutoff of about 15 years and up. Um, some people go a little lower. Um, it works very well. And in the next study, and this was done at an academic center, um, they use the ages of 14 to 20. Again, spironolactone, they're using it at the age of 14. And I have given it to a 14-year-old, yeah, a few 14-year-olds. But usually I try to stick around 15. And um, it works well. Know that spironolactone takes a little bit of time to kick in, but not as long as birth control pills, which we're going to talk about next. Um, and know that about 15 to 25 percent of the pediatric population with pretty significant acne did not respond to spironolactone. So when I was a younger doc and I started using spironolactone in my hands, I thought this is a miracle. And I was giving it to people, and I'm like, yeah, they're getting better, right? But then some people didn't. And this study confirms what I saw clinically. So not everybody responds, excuse me, <coughs> responds to spironolactone. But in that adolescent population, in that pediatric sort of adolescent population, they do well with side effects. A little bit less than 4% of them have side effects that make them stop it. And I see adult women stop a little bit more quickly than adolescents when I give them spironolactone. That being said, combined oral contraceptives, and we're not talking about the mini pill, we're talking about combined pills that have an estrogen and a progestion. When can we use them? So I've been for the last week trying to find an answer to this, so finally I emailed, um, I texted actually, a colleague who's a pediatric endocrinologist. I said, when can, what's the cutoff? I've always said two years of menses before, and she said to me, there is no exact age. She said, once they have established menstrual cycles, um, you can consider giving a birth control pill, but you want to be very careful with early teens. So I sort of use that 15, 16 cutoff, usually around 16 for contraceptions. But this is a very big point, and I should have made it bigger on the slide. You know, you got to weigh whether or not they desire contraception. If they desire contraception, then you got to, you know, birth control is probably a good way to go, right? Because the risk of a birth control pill to the patient's overall health is much less than a risk of an unwanted pregnancy. And you have to keep that in your brain. It's a, it's a little bit of a tricky concept, but if they desire contraception, you should be thinking about birth control sooner. Um, when do you do it? Ages 16 to 17. Um, you want to think about thromboembolic events. Do you have to see an OBGYN before starting a birth control pill? No, you don't have to. Um, you should do a pregnancy test. You should do their blood pressure. You should go through the risk with them, including migraine with aura. Um, these are some of the things that I do. But you don't need to have that OBGYN there to start a birth control. Now, that may be different. I'm looking down at uh, Jan here, Dr. Isakovich, because I'm thinking I know it might be different in, the, in Europe, but in the United States, you do not have to. And as part of the American Acne and Rosacea Society, we're coming up with core competencies for acne, right? So we don't have them to the extent that we want. And one of the things we want to teach our residents is how to prescribe birth control pills and not to be afraid to do that. So you can do it. You can, um, you can do it. You should do some good screening. It doesn't take long. It takes 30 seconds. Um, pick a few that you're comfortable with and learn them, and then you can prescribe oral, oral contraceptives. So teenagers, yes, you can do oral contraceptives. Diet, just a quickie here, and this is a very complex slide. I want to take your eyes down to the green at the bottom where it says omega-3 and probiotics. Those are things that can help, okay? So the omega-3s and probiotics. As far as dairy, meat, and sugar. Um, sugar's probably the worst of all of them. The dairy controversy lives on. And um, as I said once at an integrative meeting, I'm not going to tell my patients who are on limited incomes that they can't have milk. Um, to check the price of almond milk when you go to the store and check the price of your cow's milk. So I will not say that my patients can't have milk. And some people makes a difference. I'm not going to say it doesn't. But I won't tell patients not to have milk um, in my population. So this is a good review article by Jerry Tan and Hillary Baldwin. And they're really at the forefront of trying to figure this out.
Okay, so how do I do it less expensively, turning down the sugar? I tell them to watch their sugary drinks. I don't have the reference here, but there are very good references showing that if increased number of sugary drinks will increase acne. So that's an easy one, right? Instead of spending money for a sugary drink, you have a water and just less sugar overall. Uh, face washing, and I'm thinking about the patient I referenced that no one was in the room with me when I gave only one thing. Um, he wasn't washing his face every other day. His mom and his dad both came with him. They're a very nice family. Um, but we talked about washing the face. You know, this has been studied. It's two times a day. Teenage boys particularly need to wash two times a day. I tell almost every one of them they need two showers a day. It doesn't have to be a big dip, just thir three minutes and they're out. But they need to wash their face more frequently. If you have a bad atopic, of course you're not going to have them wash twice a, twice, a, um, twice a day. But in my mind, most teenagers, especially as they're entering into the teenage years during that pubescent time, um, they, can wash, uh, they can take two face washing they can wash their face twice a day or take two showers. But that has been studied, and they found out if you washed one time a day, your acne didn't look as good, and if you went four, you could irritate, okay? So which cleanser? Okay, that's always a biggie. Which cleanser? Well, this is from 2018. It's a nice study by some other pediatric derms, um, Dr. Orlo and some colleagues. And you know, there, there are articles out there, but it's hard to put it together which one is the best. So I encourage you to find one that's the best for you. I encourage you to look at this article, which looked at cleansing types um, for acne patients. Um, and find one that you like and you think will work, and think about the cost, because not everyone can afford a $15 wash. Um, so I want you to think about the cost as you do that. So how do we increase adherence? Adherence, excuse me. Um, you got to listen. Okay, you've got to think of your formulations. What are they like? Are they like pads? Are they like swabs? Try to do it once a day. Look for combination products. Ask questions like, how many times a week do you use that? Rather than, do you use your medicine? Because <laughs> then they're going to say yes. So you want to say, how many times a week do you use that? Again, listen. It's very hard sometimes, I know. Um, See what they like and dislike. Tell them it's going to take a while. You know, this isn't going to be fast like everything else in their lives. Um, show interest in them. You know, Dr. Schachner taught me early on as a resident to ask what grade they're in, what, um, what um, subjects they like in school, different things like that. So it doesn't have to be a big ex explanation or a big question. It just shows that you're interested. Again, listen. You can address um, adherence. You can say, hey, you know, is there a reason why you aren't using this medication? Um, the kids will tell you. You'd be surprised what they'll tell you. No, I don't like the smell of that. No, it, it's sticky. You messed up my sheets. Um, no, it leaves something. So they'll tell you. Um, evaluate what they say and quickly have a plan in place so you can see them and move forward. Um, pediatric patients are different than adults. So you have to keep that in mind that they're kids. Um, finally, electronic visits, this has been studied, have helped with acne. Um, and I want you to remember as we transition to our next, um, our next talk about diverse populations. Um, my clinic is, I like my clinic. Uh, I do very much. And yesterday, towards the end, I kicked the residents out. And who was it? Natalie, I think. I kicked her out. The reason I kicked Natalie out is because I had a young lady who was transitioning. And um, we were talking to her about, we're, we should been on isotretinoin cleared up and then did a low dose and, and she was transitioning. So um, she goes to DASH, which is one of our sort of artsy schools here in Miami, and it's, she has a good counselor. And she and her, her, she, her mom and I talked. Um, and we, we had a very nice conversation. And she was okay with the whole the way I play just set up and everything like that. And we're going to start her back on Accutane, but be sensitive to these kids. Um, she has, I knew this was happening eight months ago. But I didn't bring it up then. This was the time to bring it up. I built trust with her, and then we did it. So it's important that you think about that. And I'm, I know Dr. Peebles will expand on this in his next talk. But I want you to think about that. And what's in the pipeline? We always want to know what's new, right? So there are some bactericidal agents that are coming down the pipeline. There are some anti-sebum agents. And way out of my comfort zone are lasers and lights. But I want to tell you about a, a new FDA-approved laser system that was approved in um, November of 2022, and it cures uh, acne treatment, and it is photothermolysis, if I'm saying that right. 
Um, the reason I'm excited about it is it's something different that I don't do. I'm also excited about it because it seems to have some long-term cure rates for that patient who doesn't want a pill and doesn't want a cream. I get no money from them. I just thought it was interesting. It's something new in the pipeline. As far as the age, I reached out to the company this morning. I didn't hear, but I asked Dr. Mandy, one of the other faculty at UM, and he thought maybe about the age of 12. So I, I anticipate that this will be able to be used on teenagers. So I want you to know, even though I don't do lasers and lights, that they are important things to keep in our armamentarian. And I should know more about them. So I'm going to keep working on that. And again, to wrap up, listen. You just have to listen. Have a plan for your medications, for your washes, for the diet, and for future and alternative treatments. Thanks. That's it. <laughs> I'm delighted and uh, highly anticipate to introduce and highly anticipate the talk of our next speaker. Dr. Peebles is a board certified dermatologist, spent most of his early training around Vanderbilt for his undergraduate, his medical, and his internship, uh, headed to Wisconsin where he was a Durham resident and chief resident. We chief residents have to stick together. Uh, lots of expertise, immunobullous disorders, autoimmune connective tissue disease, lots of activism, immediate past chair of the AAD's expert research group on LGBTQ slash HDM, uh, editorial board of the Journal of the AAD, serves as co-chair of the Journal's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion work group. So this is obviously a, a very strong commitment uh, for Clint, he's going to talk on pearls for LGBTQ patient care. Please welcome him to the podium. Welcome to our meeting. Thank you so much. Good to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'm so gratified that we're including this particular content uh, in, in this lineup this year. This is a, an incredibly important uh, topic to me and a population that I've just been truly gratified to work with, and I'm really appreciative to have had this as part of the lineup. Um, so. I, this talk is going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. If you want to take a deeper dive into this, uh, take a look at what we have going on tomorrow morning, uh, where we'll have kind of more of a sexual and gender diverse dermatology summit with several great faculty. Uh, but so don't miss that if you have a, a more of an interest. Um, I don't have any uh, relevant financial relationships with industry. So whenever I talk about this these days, it's hard not to start with some of the current socio-political events. And you may have seen in recent years all of this barrage of anti-transgender uh, and, uh, and legislation that's intended to restrict the movements and navigation of sexual and gender diverse people. And this has been throughout the state. So it's not just in, in a region or in one state. This is pretty much everywhere. Now, not to say that it's passing um, necessarily everywhere, but we're seeing this spring up pretty consistently. So more legislation was filed in 2022 um, to disrupt trans lives than any other year in American history. And transgender youth are the most frequent targets, although that's starting to change this year. There were almost 400 bills introduced in the last four years. At least 13 states signed them into law. And this comes across multiple domains. It's not just healthcare, it's athletics, it's education, legal documents, identity documents, Documents, religious exemptions. And this year is shaping up to be no different. We've hit the ground running already. More than 150 anti-trans bills in at least 25 states, one that's been already signed into law in Utah, um, more than two dozen restricting transgender health care. Uh, and in Oklahoma, South Carolina, Kansas, and Mississippi, they're extending beyond just restricting care for transgender youth now into adulthood as well. Uh, and Tennessee's announced that one of its first priorities is to target transgender people. So we're seeing this kind of take shape uh, through a host of domains and if you haven't been following that definitely be in tune to that because this landscape is really rapidly changing and it's hurting people right anti-transgender legislation is something that is stigmatizing and it's harmful and two-thirds of LGBTQ youth are reporting that these events and these conversations and these debates are impacting their mental health the vast majority of transgender and non-binary people are reporting negative effects on their mental health. And when we look across major data nationally from a variety of states, looking at these experiences and outcomes in, in school-aged children, we see that the landscape of bullying, feeling unsafe, suicidal ideation, substance abuse, all of these things are far outpaced in the gender diverse community than they are in cisgender folks. And I'll get to those terms in a little bit for those who aren't aware. Um, but this is having a real world impact on the ground. And 
one of the more staggering statistics we see is that in this uh, kind of major survey from 2015 of almost 50,000 trans individuals, we see that almost half of trans folks are reporting suicidal ideation and attempts. It's just really mind-numbing how, per how pervasive this is. And we know that validation of identity in healthcare is protective, and I'm going to get to that. But always to start out with kind of a few core you know, terminology points for those who aren't aware, I always emphasize the difference between sex and gender. So sex kind of being what we call sex assigned at birth, and this refers to that really appearance of external anatomy, and it's not necessarily immutable either, depending on how we frame it, especially when we're talking about intersex folks or those with differences of sex development. Gender, on the other hand, is that social construction that we've arbitrarily linked in a binary model to sex assigned at birth, but but it's different. These concepts of femininity and masculinity, which can be fluid, but gender is not inherently defined by sex. Transgender would be someone whose identity differs from that, uh, from their sex assigned at birth that would be normally assumed, whereas cisgender would be gender identity aligning with that sex assigned at birth. And we see a lot of different concepts, trans, non-binary, gender queer, gender non-conforming, all of these things can be thought of in terms of an umbrella of gender diversity, gender expansiveness, gender minority. Those are all terms that you may see. And this is kind of a busy slide that tries to put all of this together. And, and believe me, I'm not trying to put this here to make this intentionally complicated, right? You look at this and say, oh my goodness, all of these different terms that I have to know and they evolve and ask about all of this. The, the point really is that we just simply can't make assumptions about folks' identities versus their behaviors and vice versa, right? All of these things have very distinct connotations, they have distinct behaviors, they have distinct consequences. And we have to kind of understand that as we risk stratify, whether it's whether someone can become pregnant, whether someone has the risk of becoming pregnant, whether someone needs contraception, and we'll kind of talk about those issues as well. But sexual orientation and gender identity are distinct from each other. Gender expression being how someone conveys their gender identity outwardly, um, and all of those can be different as well. But really, just to understand, especially when we're talking about adolescence, that gender expansiveness is much more of a fluid concept than transgender itself in most cases. So gender expansiveness would really just mean that there's some behaviors or preferences, other traits that are not necessarily what we call gender typical in contrast with transgender when there's actually a distress associated with those incongruences and differences. And that's when various elements of transition may be needed. And that really brings us to this notion of gender dysphoria, which is this strong, persistent distress or impairment with those sex characteristics and the ascribed gender roles that are incongruent with their gender identity. Now, not all gender diverse people are gonna experience dysphoria, myself for instance, I have a relatively complicated relationship with gender, but I don't use pronouns and that type of thing, but I don't have distress as I navigate through life, right? But other people may, and that's when affirmation um, and, and transition may become necessary. And gender affirmation is not just surgery, right? Gender affirmation can be just simply affirming it to yourself. Social affirmation changes with legal documents, uses of pronouns, legal affirmation, medical, hormones, puberty blockers we'll get to, and then the whole gamut of surgical affirmation, which isn't as much of a topic in adolescent care, which I'll review. But just remember that not all people will want any or all of these domains, right? There are gonna be different needs for different people. So just remember that you can't make assumptions, right? Sexual behaviors can't be inferred by orientation necessarily. There was a big survey showing that a quarter of high school students who identify as heterosexual actually had same-sex sexual behaviors, even exclusively, and they still identify as heterosexual. So just remember that behaviors can't be inferred. So this is a growing community. The identification is ticking up, and I emphasize identification, remembering that transgender people have been around since antiquity, um, but we're seeing more and more kind of you know, realization and affirmation of this in a social context, and that's why these numbers are going up. Um, about 1.8% of children in the US identify as transgender, um, and in some cases, depending on maybe urban districts in certain geographical areas, there are some schools that are reporting as many as 10% of their kids are identifying as gender diverse. And so 
where do we kind of get our standards for care for how we treat gender diversity and, and address transition? Most of it comes from WPATH, or the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, and these standards of care were first developed in the 1970s, and for a while now, since 2012, we've been living with the standard of care version 7. And just last fall, we saw that the standard of care version 8 came out, and some of the key points and updates for that is really that a one-size model doesn't work for everyone. There were some arbitrary age limits kind of put on various elements of treatment, uh, and, and that's kind of been changed and a little bit more liberal at this point. But to emphasize a major point, the only form of gender-affirming care for children before puberty is simply social support. There are no surgeries happening on prepubertal children, and that is a, a very important thing to, to talk about um, and to emphasize and something that WPATH has been very clear about and that's not recommended. But um, prior to receiving that care, there has to be an identity experience that's been marked over time and persistent. Uh, and also the mental health part of this has been laxed as well. It used to be the case that we couldn't really get folks into the gender diverse and transition treatment pathway until they were basically approved by mental health. So mental health was kind of the gatekeeper. But we've realized, of course, that being trans is not a mental illness. And so that has been relaxed, but knowing, of course, that there can certainly be issues that related to mental health that need to be addressed, and that's certainly a part of it. And so common steps in gender transition we've already talked about, social transition, puberty blockers, hormone therapy, and gender surgeries. And we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about a few of these. But just to kind of emphasize the point that trans people who do not have gender affirming care have worse outcomes, uh, greater risk of depression, anxiety, substance abuse, suicidal ideation. All of these things are important and studies are showing time after time that this care is important and it's life saving and DERM can actually play a role in it. And there used to also be this notion that, well, we don't really want to kind of have this open approach to puberty blockers in early childhood or at the, in the pubertal setting because that's probably just gonna channel people down a pathway quickly to hormones. And we found that that's really not true. Pubertal suppression is not associated with an increased risk of subsequent hormone use. It's mostly just to kind of give adolescents the chance and the space to navigate and figure out their identity to make sure that this is where they want to go. And so this was a, a great article that just came out a few weeks ago in the New England Journal, one of the biggest studies to date, looking at um, several hundred trans and non-binary individuals that were followed for two years after initiating hormone therapy. And that started for anywhere from 12 years old to the um, oldest participant here was 20. And again, finding that there's an, an increased uh, you know, kind of mental health outcome, positive life experiences and satisfaction, decreased anxiety, depression, and the overall all takeaways are they really that withholding treatment may lead to an increased risk of dysphoria and adverse events. So this was a great study. Um, puberty suppression a little bit more specifically was something you may see in the adolescent population. So this is done through GnRHs or gonadotropin releasing hormone agonists. You may remember those complicated pathways from med school. Um, but the examples of that would be the most common would be Luperwellin or, or Luprime, and it suppresses LHFSH through pituitary desensitization. And just to kind of know that historically, they actually tried using this way back in the 80s um, in women um, to treat acne, and they actually found that it could be a little bit effective, but it was, of course, abandoned due to cost and, and you know, some side effects over the long term related to bone health, um, hot flashes, headache, and things like that. But just know that this can cause a little bit of acne improvement for people who were already on it for the purpose of puberty suppression, but of course not used as a primary acne agent. But I did want to go over some pearls specifically about acne management. We already heard this the great talk from before, um, but in trans feminine individuals, those transitioning, for instance, from male to female, so topical agents may be more irritating. So estrogen therapy can make the skin a little bit more dry. And combined oral contraceptives should not be used in those who started hormone therapy with estrogen, obviously the additive risk of uh, thromboembolic disease. 
Spironolactone can be used, but it's often already being used as a part of the gender-affirming therapy. Usually that consists of an estrogen and an anti-androgen, usually spironolactone, um, and, but that should be coordinated with their primary gender clinician, and the doses are actually similar with what we use. In transmasculine, we already heard about clascoterone. This is actually a wonderful uh, option that I've been using a lot in my trans men lately um, because we can't use spironolactone in them because it offsets the impact of testosterone, of course. So I've had some good results. I'm, I'm a little, I'm not quite totally sold in there yet, but I am having some, some positive results so far. Um, it's not irritating. It tends to do pretty well and there's, I can get coverage for. Sometimes you might want to look at the serum testosterone level, especially when it's above 630 nanograms per deciliter. That has been shown to be associated more with acne, although some studies are showing that the T levels really don't make much of a difference. The important thing is that oral contraceptives do not prevent masculinization, and they can be used along with testosterone. Now, there are some nuances to this depending on the individual, but there is no form of contraception that's off limits just because someone is on testosterone. So just keep that in mind when you're selecting the best agent for your patient, for instance, if you're wanting to put someone on isotretinoin. And also remember, too, that the notion of taking oral contraceptives um, can trigger dysphoria because of the association with being used in people assigned female at birth. And just a little bit about isotretinoin specifically, so just remember that that pregnancy potential and sexual behavioral history is really important, right? So what are you really getting at when you're wanting to stratify that risk? You want to know if there's receptive penile vaginal intercourse with an individual who produces sperm, right? That's what you need to know. So don't assume, you know, questions based on, you know, are you having sex, right? Because what kind of sex is that? right? Um, and, you know, what are the genders and bodies of your sexual partners? Because someone may have gender fluid partners, and based on how they identify, that might not tell you what their anatomy is, right? I pledge doesn't conflate gender identity with pregnancy potential any longer, which is great, um, but normalize that pregnancy risk is going to be assessed for everybody. And acknowledge the mental health intersections. There's a, that's a huge one, because we know that acne and gender diversity independently are linked to more depression and anxiety, and together, those rates are exponentially higher. But, you know, of course we manage that, but also with affirmation, with isotretinoin, if they have severe acne, that depression and anxiety actually tends to improve very substantially. So don't let that scare you. Just kind of be upfront about those risks and coordinate it with the other providers. And then discuss any planning for invasive affirmation procedures. The literature, of course, shows that more for minimally invasive procedures, we're not really seeing a huge impact on wound healing with isotretinoin. But for in instance, planning for other surgeries like top surgery, so mastectomy, and trans men, that's one of the few surgeries that may be done later in adolescence. It's important to coordinate that because some surgeons still will not do those procedures um, until they've been off isotretinoin for a certain length of time. And as far as laboratory monitoring, we're not seeing that there needs to be any difference between how that's addressed between cis and trans populations. So for me, that does not change at all. Although sometimes I will do serum pregnancy testing rather than urine pregnancy testing because that can be a little bit less dysphoria triggering. This is a busy slide you may not be able to see, um, but kind of similar to before, this is a wonderful reference paper going over contraception in transmasculine people. Wonderful table showing all the pros and cons of all the options, and this is actually a really stellar paper out of the guying literature talking about how to take a sensitive history, all about terminology, mechanisms, hormonal pathways. It's just a really solid paper that I would uh, encourage you to look up. A little bit of a pivot now. I did want to talk briefly about skin cancer and sexual diversity. So sexual diverse men, those who don't identify as heterosexual, um, they are twice as likely as heterosexual men to report a history of skin cancer. Um, sexual diverse men reporting three to six fold higher rates of indoor tanning. This includes adolescence. And so we think that disparity is really resulting largely from disproportionate um, behaviors for UV light exposure. So the tanning bed use, less 
wearing of clothing, um, more sun exposure. And so that individualized counseling and risk stratification is important, and this is a way that we can really kind of hone in on some of those preventative conversations. So if you have, you know, gay adolescents in your clinic, you know, kind of talking about the importance of minimizing, you know, those kind of sun uh, risk behaviors is going to be really crucial moving forward because there's a lot that, that disproportionately high increased risk of indoor tanning. And so in the last minute or so, I just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of those safe and welcoming affirming spaces. We'll hear a lot more about this tomorrow if you're interested, but just kind of knowing about eliciting the, right, the patient's story, listening as we heard before, which is such a wonderful pearl that we can't get enough of, using the right language and knowing when to apologize. I make mistakes all the time and I just say, you know, I'm, I'm committed to doing better and I want to learn as I go. And really it's just such a wonderful thing working with the gender diverse population because I see this evolution over time and people who just say, I want to feel more like me, help me get there, right? And it's just so gratifying to see, you know, those positive steps being taken. But just recognize that, you know, the words that we say can have consequences. And I, I this is a little bit of a lighthearted cartoon, but I use it just to really point out the fact that, you know, sometimes when we think about misgendering a person's pet for instance, and how that might contrast with our reaction to misgendering a person. Um, and I think, you know, not to make light of this because I am a, a devoted animal welfare and anti-species as activist, but all of that to be said is that, you know, we have to kind of look at gender diversity in the same way and remember that misgendering can be harmful when it comes to, um, to people just like it could be anything else, right? And so recognizing that confidentiality is really important, time alone with the adolescents critical, confirm name and pronouns, you'd be surprised how often that may change depending on the clinic encounter. Um, it's, again, it's just fun kind of seeing that progress. Open-ended questions, gender neutrality, the last thing, just kind of third-person language. Sometimes I find it easier to kind of get information from a child or adolescent about sexual behaviors when I just kind of say, you know, are any of your friends having sex? You know, what are your friends doing, right? As opposed to kind of asking specifically about them, and those conversations can flow a little bit more organically after that. Um, and then, of course, the clinic environment as well, gender neutral restrooms, all of that. But in these slides will be there for you so you can see that. And then finally, this is my kind of general approach, my kind of algorithm that I use to kind of have some of these conversations, that flow chart of asking about sex and gender and sexual behaviors and how that all kind of comes together. Um, and I'm happy to share that with you at any time too. But I know that's a whirlwind, but thank you for your time um, and be sure to join us tomorrow if you have an interest. Thank you. Uh, Clint, we have a break coming up in a, an hour or so. If you stay around, I'm sure uh, some of the audience would like to meet with you and ask some questions. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Theodore uh, Rosen. Uh, Ted uh, did his medical degree in Michigan and went on to residency in Durban Bell and become a leader in our field. He's a past board member of the Academy of Durham, past vice president, written over 300 papers. Like Dr. Kirai, he uh, is a professor and chief of dermatology at a, at a veterans hospital, in this case in Houston. Through the years, I have found Ted to be amazing in his erudition, wonderful in his wit and humor, and just a have the most outstanding collection of teaching slides on the subject. So we're going to have the benefit of uh, Ted's lecture on skin manifestations of STDs. I think that we'll hear about everything from adolescents to newborns, and I look forward to it. Thanks for joining us, Ted. Thank you. I have never said this before a lecture. I am sorry to give this lecture. I'm sorry to have to give this lecture. I'm sorry it has to be given. But if you look at even the first slide here, 50% of all STD infections in the United States are in individuals 15 to 24. Okay, we missed a couple of years of adolescence and we missed a couple of years of pre-adolescence, but this is a big deal. I have no conflicts of interest. So I'm gonna whirlwind again through this, realize that pediatric patients can suffer from STD, recognize and treat them, and I think we need to do a better job educating young people about risky sexual behaviors, and I'll tell you a little personal story about that. 
So this is the burden now in the United States, two and a half million cases. We don't have the 2022 data. We won't until October of this year. If we're lucky, everything's been postponed because of COVID. And just take a second and look at these numbers. They are absolutely astounding between 2018 and 2021, especially look at the infectious forms of syphilis, most infectious, primary and secondary, how that's increased. And sadly, look at this, congenital syphilis has doubled. So this is an important thing. If you don't know this, you need to know it. A lot of kids don't get tested. Why don't they get tested? Because they don't want to go to their family physician, because they're afraid the family physician is going to rat them out to their parents. This is a new government. The government, to me, is totally dysfunctional. But this is actually a good government program. It's called Get Tested. You can go online, and of course the kids are very good at going online. You can type in your city, you press search, and it shows you the clinics in your city. And you can go even further and look for free clinics, free, and you can pick what you want tested. So syphilis, chlamydia, herpes, all these can be done free and confidential regardless of age. It's a federal program. It's very, very good. If you have a lot of adolescents or people at high risk for developing STDs, there are all these very good posters. You can get them free from the CDC and post to encourage people to get themselves tested. And let's say someone doesn't want to go to a clinic. Let's say they want to do it all at home. I think most of us don't realize this. There are now three do-it-at-home tests. Yes, they're expensive, and they go up, depending upon the number of things that are tested, but you can even test for syphilis from home without telling your parents if you're an adolescent. So I think this is really cool. Notice all the things that can be tested for. It's not just syphilis. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, syphilis, HIV, HCV. So, you know, unfortunately, I've said that at the beginning, but look at the second line there. Over a third of infectious syphilis is 13 to 18. That is astounding. And it can be both those who have sex with men who have sex with men, but also straight boys. And here's the thing. People who are going to get STDs, particularly syphilis, this has now been conclusively demonstrated. Their risk increases if they have adverse childhood events. I've listed some of those. And you might become aware of that while you're treating these kids for things like acne or warts. So very quickly about syphilis. Primary, the shank or solitary indurated painless erosion. Keep in mind that 12 to 14% of these are off the genitalia, usually on the lips and on the tongue. Then you go to the secondary form with a widespread eruption. Always look at palms and soles. But palms and soles don't have to be affected. It can be any rash, generally not itchy. If it's itchy, rethink that as a possibility. You can have oral lesions including condyloma lata in the mouth, in the throat. You can have mucus patches, these raw areas, particularly on the tongue. About 15% of patients with syphilis will have some oral manifestation. And you can have condyloma lata. That's part of secondary syphilis. And you can have moth-eaten alopecia. Two to 7% of syphilitic patients present with alopecia as their primary complaint if you see someone like this, who's a 13-year-old, brought in by mom with hair loss. So I'm thinking, oh good, this is going to be an easy case, right? This is going to be either tinea or alopecia areata. I'm going to be out of that room in 10 minutes, maybe five, and it's going to be fine. Except that there were no signs that were typical of alopecia areata, and no signs typical of tinea capitis. So I asked mom to leave. And I asked the patient an important question. And Clint already mentioned this. It's really important. You cannot be shy about asking people about sex. And you have to be specific. Sex, how, with whom, when. You just can't. And that's true 
pediatric patients. So it turns out he had positive serology. He was having sex with his 20-year-old sister. I should rephrase that. She was abusing him. She was raping him. She's an adult. And she was acting as a prostitute. So I gave him Bicillin and his hair regrew. And yes, I did call Child Protective Services. And yes, that was a big to-do. She got kicked out of the house as a prerequisite for him staying with his mother. But hair loss, syphilis. OK, congenital syphilis. I know this is about adolescence, but I have to point out, this is such a big problem now. These are the 2020 data. The 2021 data, there's even more, but we don't have the state distributions yet. I've put the highest states in terms of numbers listed there. But it might be different. I seriously doubt it will be, but it might be different 2021. A lot of this is for lack of testing. Congenital syphilis can lead to horrible outcomes of pregnancy, including loss of the baby, prematurity, low birth weight, and so forth. It can also lead to all sorts of abnormalities from our perspective. We're talking in a derm conference, so we're talking about skin. You need to re-familiarize yourself with the cutaneous manifestations of congenital syphilis since we've doubled in the number of cases since 2018. Notice exfoliation is a common theme, widespread eruption that's not specific. You can't look at that diaper rash and say, oh, that's congenital syphilis. Always look, it's particularly common on the palms and soles, and it present, may present as large lakes of pus that's not typically what you see in adults. So congenital syphilis, just real quickly, high risk. Who's at high risk? Women with multiple partners, sex with drug use or transactional sex, late or no prenatal care, methamphetamine or heroin use, incarceration of the woman or her partner, or homelessness. So. Think about who's at risk for this. Now, theoretically, you're supposed to get a test for syphilis in the first trimester. But if someone meets those criteria, they really should have several additional tests, particularly in the third trimester. Treatment during pe pregnancy is penicillin. And I've shown the doses here. One thing that's very important, if a woman's found to have primary or secondary syphilis, and she's pregnant, that's the highest risk to the baby. And most people now are recommending an additional dose of Bicillin, 2.4 million units. Not one, which is all that's typically recommended, but two doses. And then you confirm congenital syphilis, and the child is treated with penicillin. I think an ID person should be involved here, clearly. OK, HPV. There's about 200 forms of HPV, 120 of them are typically pathogenic in man. The low-risk HPV most commonly cause genital warts. These can be transmitted transplacentally or at birth, so you might see this in a neonate. But if you see it in someone who's three or four or five or six or seven, start thinking about sexual abuse or sex trafficking. And that would also be true in an adolescent, but also could be due to consensual sex. So genital warts, what can we say? We don't know what the incubation period is, anywhere from three weeks to eight months. Seropositivity goes up when sexual abuse goes up. But seropositivity is not the same thing as having genital warts. You may have a seropositivity rate in the double digits, but only 1% to 2% of those abused children have external genital warts. So a lot of these go away on their own. You can take a wait and see. Prevention has been very, very helpful. External genital warts have decreased dramatically since we started to vaccinate. Please be aware it only requires two. HP, the only thing that's available now is the nanovalent vaccine. It only requires two shots if that is given under 15 years of age. And it's approved down to nine. The ideal time to get someone HPV vaccinated is nine, 10, 11, 12, before they're likely to start doing sexual activity. That's the best time possible. There are a few risks, but by far, the benefits exceed those risks. 
And if someone has no insurance or they're underinsured, another actually useful government program is called Vaccines for Children, and they will pay for HPV vaccine entirely for anyone under age 18. Treatment goals, you try and get rid of the warts, but you may not totally eliminate infectivity. The way we treat genital warts is based on what's there. I just want to highlight synecatechins. No one seems to ever know about this because it had three absolutely crappy launches. This is a green tea derivative that is directly antiviral and apoptotic and causes very, very minimal inflammation. It's particularly good for younger individuals who don't want anything that's inflammatory. And then we have all the other ways you know how to treat genital warts. I just want to point out those two are genital warts, but the other two are not. The top picture there is due to chronic inflammation from either urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence. And the bottom picture is a congenital thing. People are actually born with that pyramidal looking thing that's by the anus. It's not a wart, it's like a nothing. Don't treat it as such. HSV, younger, younger, younger people, that's usually transmitted by a caregiver. You start worrying about sexual abuse as well as sex trafficking if you start seeing genital herpes over age five. Adolescence, again, mostly it's consensual sex, but could be sexual abuse at home or sex trafficking, and that's usually HSV2. Acyclovir is my drug of choice. You can use valacyclovir or famcyclovir. Learn one, learn the doses, and you don't need to use the, know the rest. Here's some herpes I've seen in young people. Look at the 12-year-old who is having sex with his 16-year-old neighbor. Never discount STDs based on age. If you remember nothing else I say, remember that sentence. And then scabies, usually not sexually transmitted, typically from a family member who's giving care. Remember as little as 10 minutes of skin-to-skin -skin contact. All you need to transmit scabies. In children, it looks a little bit different. Always think about it when you see something on the face, the palms, the sole, and the scalp. And crusted scabies follows immunosuppression. And I've listed all the ways you can treat this. The newest one is spinosad, 0.9% suspension. You're probably familiar with that. It's been around since 2011 to treat head lice. But now it's also approved down to the age of four to treat scabies. It's one application overnight. And I want to point out there is now resistance to permethrin and ivermectin. So if you use those for a scabies patient and they don't get better, it doesn't mean they didn't do it they might have resistant organisms. And their scabies always look palms, soles. And there are two examples at the extremes of age of immunosuppression leading to crusted scabies. A small child with letter of seaweed disease, a form of histiocytosis X, and a 17-year-old who is getting steroids. He, you can almost see how cushionoid his face is for lupus, and he's got crusted scabies. So I'm going to finish up. I might be 30 seconds late, but education. We need to do a better job of educating our kids about STDs. A quick story. I have a pair of twin, identical twin girls. They've watched me put together STD talks their whole lives. I didn't shield them from it. In the days when we used slides, I would show it on the living room wall, and they would sit there, and they absorbed all that. So they were in their senior year of high school. And the football coach was teaching STD. And so he made a statement that was incorrect. So one of my daughters said, yes, Jennifer. She said, coach, you're wrong. Syphilis is a bacteria, not a virus. And you certainly can transmit it with oral lesions. Have you ever heard of condylomalata or mucus patches? Or how about extra genital chancres? So this football coach looked rather dumbfounded. I wish I had been there to see that moment. He looked dumbfounded. He said, well, if you know so GD much, why don't you teach the course with your sister? And she said, we'll be happy to do it. So they came home. They borrowed my slides. They made a few more slides, had to be approved by the principal. And they taught STD to the senior class in their high school for a whole year. And I'm proud of them because they still do Rape Crisis Center. 
even as adults, 38 years old. And the last thing I want to talk about is this. Please don't think of me as a Puritan prude, but, you know, we have this crap on TV, on cable, advertisements. Do we really have to resort to things like this? Who thinks Heidi Klum, who's now showing everything but her pubertal hair here, who thinks that Heidi Klum eats a 3,000 calorie hamburger. It's Carl's Jr. I mean, really, really? Do we have to resort to this kind of an image to sell Nike shoes? So I think some of these advertisements, really, they glorify irresponsible sex. They condone casual sex. They de-emphasize the risk, which is the most important thing, and they promote moral relativism. I'm not a Puritan or prude, but I think we need to just think about what we show in society and what messages we're giving that might be inappropriate to our very, very young and vulnerable patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Ted. Not, not to grab equal time, but when Ted told the, told the story about his uh, daughters, uh, my son Adam was nine at the time. I used to do the same thing with slides at home. And uh, he used to work at the Jackson Clinic as a volunteer when he was a young guy, 10, 11, during the summer handing out stuff for research projects, whatever. And it was, you know, first couple of weeks for the new residents. And some poor little kid uh, hobbled into the clinic with syndactyly. And Adam looked at my new residents and went, epidermolysis bullosa. And the residents, I'm sure, studied very hard that night. <laughs> Back to the podium. Uh, Dr. Uh, Craiglow, do you know Jack? obviously a theme among dermatologists. We have six and eight year old boys and routinely they'll say, ah, did that patient have alopecia areata? Mommy, I saw someone who I think has vitiligo. Um, <laughs> they know all the words already. Um, okay, so we are gonna talk about Jack and hopefully by the end you will know a little bit more about Jack. Here are my disclosures again. Um, so we're going to start with just talking about cytokine signaling. I promise it's not too science heavy, but, um, and I, I apologize for those of you who are here at lunch because there is a little overlap, but I think it is important to understand what JAKs are, what they do, and why they're important for us in dermatology, okay? So we know that inflammatory diseases are modulated by cytokines, right? There are lots of different cytokines, and they, um, you know, they drive a lot of disease processes that make patients come into our offices every single day, right? They are the problem. <laughs> they are the problems. Um, but you see all these cytokines, that are, you, we see them, you know, elevated in psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, vitiligo, right? They have, a, there's a common theme here. They all signal via the JAK-STAT pathway, okay? So JAKs are kind of signal transmitters um, taking messages from these cytokines, influencing gene transcription. So, um, if you were here at new and you heard this before, but I like to think about the jack stat pathway as kind of like a relay race. So first you have your cytokine floating around in the extracellular space, right? And in order to exert its action, it first needs to bind to its receptor. And that receptor sits on the outside of the cell and it accepts the cytokine and that kicks off the race, okay? So the cytokine is passing the baton to the cytokine receptor, which then passes it to the jacks. And jacks are proteins or enzymes. They sit on the inside of the cell. It's a family, therefore different of them, but it's not super important. Um, and what they do is they take the message, they take the baton, and then they pass it to these things called stats, which then take the baton down to the nucleus where gene transcription gets influenced, and then basically that causes the cell to create more inflammation, okay? And so, um, you know, when we have these cytokines and inflammatory diseases, we have different ways to modulate them, right? So we have receptors that act on the cytokines, I mean, we have uh, medicines, monoclonal antibodies that act on the cytokines themselves, they can act on the receptors, but now we also have these small molecules that act on the jacks, okay? So you can see they're a little bit less targeted, but we're able to get a little bit more of those signals that are kind of driving the processes. So this helps explain their efficacy, but also why safety profile is a little different from something that's super targeted just hitting this one half of a receptor, okay? Does that make sense? 
All right, so um, we now have several JAK inhibitors approved in dermatology. Um, I'm just gonna talk about a couple of them in this talk. I know this is an adolescent talk, but I am gonna talk about baricitinib because we have a lot of patients with alopecia areata and that's like 80% of my life. So um, we have topical ruxolitinib, which we heard about with vitiligo, also approved in atopic dermatitis. Abricitinib is approved for atopic dermatitis right now, 18 and up, but we should be seeing a 12 and up approval, I think, very soon. Ducravacitinib recently approved for psoriasis, and there are lots of other JAKs in trials um, in different inflammatory skin diseases, including in pediatrics. So this is just the beginning, and this is really, these medicines are really revolutionizing dermatology. I mean, we have the ability now to treat these diseases that we really never thought we could treat, um, or at least not very well, right? So first, we're going to talk about atopic dermatitis, and I just have this slide here to, to kind of call out that this is a really clinical clinically heterogeneous disease, right? So it looks different in different people, and I think, you know, kind of like I mentioned before, we want to treat the patient. So sometimes, especially in the case of like papular eczema, it might not look that bad, right? So sometimes I'll have residents come out of the room to me and they'll say, oh, they're here for atopic derm and it's not that bad. And they know now not to say that because I say, wait, it's not that bad to you or it's not that bad to them. Right? And I think we have to remind ourselves, especially, you know, those of us in, in specialized, um, you know, settings, we see the worst of the worst, right? We see the kid who's erythrodermic with shaking chills, but that doesn't mean that the kid with that, you know, covered in follicularly based papules isn't really uncomfortable, right? And so you ask the mom of that not so bad kid, do you ever wake up, does he ever wake up scratching? Oh my gosh, every night. You know, is he embarrassed about the way his skin looks? Yes, et cetera. Okay, so again, we're treating the patient, not the disease, and AD looks really different in different people, okay? So what's happening in atopic dermatitis? Um, you know, it's a complicated pathophysiology, but I, I do think it's important for us to talk to our patients about what's happening on a very high level, but just so they kind of get why we're asking them to do what we're asking them to do, right? So when I talk to patients and families about it, I say, okay, look, this is kind of a two-fold problem, and we know it's not quite that, but basically first there's a barrier problem, right? There's a barrier defect, so that means that water gets out more easily, the inside world, um, and then the outside world gets in more easily, okay? And so people kind of understand irritants and allergens and they know about gentle skin care and all that kind of stuff. So that's all barrier based, right? So the second problem is that when these irritants and allergens get through, they kind of activate the immune system in a way that's pathologic, right? So maybe my immune system sees it as like, ah, I can handle it. Someone with atopic dermatitis, the immune system gets really revved up, right? So then all these cytokines get activated, they're floating around, you can see lots of them here, and there's all this interplay in between, but what do these all have in common? They're signaling via JAKSTAT, okay? And so this is why for our patients who were, you know, were treating their inflammation with maybe a JAK inhibitor or another mechanism, this is why it's not time to like even though they're better, they don't like go on a shopping spree at Bath and Body Works, right? Like I know you want to use the X body spray, but you still have the barrier defect, right? So kind of reminding them about that is important. Okay, so we're gonna talk about upadacitinib. So this is approved for patients 12 years and older with moderate to severe AD, and this is what the label says. Um, whose disease is not adequately controlled with other systemic products, including biologics, or when those therapies are not advisable, okay? So this, in general, is going to be a second-line ther therapy after dupilumab, um, but I think it's really important to know that there are other things. In PD Derm, we love dupilumab. It's changed so many of our patients' lives, but there are patients who don't get that much better or they get better, but they're still not clear, right? And I think what's interesting in atopic derm is a lot of those patients, like, it's the best they've ever been, so they're, they're pretty happy, right? And they don't know maybe that they could be better. It's a different sort of level of hunger for clear, I think, than like psoriasis, you know? Because I think the difference with psoriasis is, you have normal skin, then you get psoriasis, and you're like, what the hell is this? Like, make it go away, right? And you still have these little few things, and people are want to push, 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 right? Whereas atopic derm, you look at a kid, they're still kind of moderate. How are things going? Oh, pretty good, you know? So I often say if I were lazy, my life would be a lot easier because you could just look at that kid and say, hey, you're good, you're happy, cool, write you the script, you know, I'll see you in six months or a year or whatever, but 
Now in some cases we can actually do better and we can make our patients' lives better. So um, this is some of the data for upadacitinib. Um, what's kind of cool is JAK inhibitors tend to work very quickly. So IL-31, one of the key drivers of itch is also cycling through or signaling via JAK stat. Okay, so oftentimes, you know, if you look at the data, even as early as two days, and I think you hear then you're like, oh yeah, whatever. I will tell you now, I've had a few patients, after a few days, they are reporting improvement in itch. Like, it can be very dramatic, and really, it's pretty exciting to see. There's a box warning, okay? We're gonna talk about that more towards the end, um, as well as the AEs, and you do have to check labs on these medicines, okay? Um, so this, I think, you know, I want to call out, this is data in adults and not in kids, but I think this is important, right? So at, you've had a sitinib, JAK inhibitors, they do work quickly, but over time, if you compare them to dupilumab, they're fairly similar. Okay, so this again is why, you know, in atopic dermatitis, this is a chronic disease, right? Especially for our pediatric patients. This is something they're gonna be dealing with probably for a long time. I do think it's cool to consider that maybe these medicines actually may change the natural history of their disease, and we're seeing some cool data coming out looking at allergy and patients treated with these medicines, et cetera. But nevertheless, this is like a marathon and not a sprint, right? So unless you have a kid who really needed to get better yesterday, um, you know, thinking about dupilumab, again, as first line, you're probably gonna get to a pretty similar place long term. However, there are those patients who you do dupilumab and they're not better, okay? So when do I think about using upadacitinib, okay? So people who are non-responders or poor responders, or even sort of just, you know, they're kind of like, still have moderate AD. Maybe they were super severe and they're happy, but they still got a lot going on. They're still itchy. They're more than a four out of 10 on zero to 10. Like those are people who I'm thinking about it, right? AEs with dupilumab, another thing to think about, we're seeing, you know, OSDs now, ocular surface disorder or something, you know, that can be a limiting factor, not super common, but if it happens, you know, you have to cut bait. This is important. Um, so comorbid diseases that may also be impacted by JAK inhibition, okay? So a lot of our patients with AD might have something else, right? They might have alopecia areata. And I told you before, alopecia areata, some of those patients do regrow with dupilumab. But in the patients who don't or who, you know, have more severe stuff going on, upadacitinib might be a better choice. I saw a patient recently who had atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, and ulcerative colitis, okay? Boom, we have a medicine that really um, may do a great thing for her. So she was on infliximab, called her GI doctor, had a conversation. The data in IBD is actually pretty good. It's approved, um, it should be approved now for Crohn's very soon also. So something to think about remembering, like look at that whole picture in front of you, right? One thing I'll say about dupilumab is that treats asthma, right? So if you've got a kid who has AD and severe asthma, that's much better with a dupilumab, even if maybe they're not clear, you gotta think about that asthma because the JAK inhibitor is probably not gonna help that that much. So we have to, you know, we're treating their AD, but we gotta remember the other stuff that's going on in their life, okay? And then the other thing is, anxiety related to injections. Um, so I think, you know, it's very uncommon for the injections to be a deal breaker, but I do have a few patients for whom it has become so problematic that they're thinking about it all the time, it's interfering with their life, and I do think, again, treatment shouldn't be worse than the disease, and that's a time maybe to think about it, okay? Of course, you're gonna try lots of other stuff. So this is a kid who I treated with upadacitinib. This is six weeks in, he was a kid like, when I first met him, we did cyclosporin, he had done phototherapy, got him off label dupilumab as soon as it came out. He was, he was like, you know, I'm good, everything's cool. And I look at him like, you're still kind of covered, buddy, you know? He was starting wrestling, you know, wrestling, they're always like, is this an infection? You have to sign all these things. And anyways, I was like, why don't we think about trying this? He's like so happy. This is a stoic kid who was actually smiling when he came in. Um, here's another patient who she had incredible anxiety with the injections for dupilumab, so much so that she literally refused to continue. And you can see with upadacitinib, amazing. This is another kid who's not perfectly clear, but much, much, much better. And this is how he had looked on dupilumab. So this is another patient who had atopic dermatitis and alopecia areata, who I treat, who actually developed worsening AA on dupilumab. And I switched him to upadacitinib. And lo and behold, he's regrowing his hair. And why is that? 
Well, that's because some of the important cytokines in alopecia areata also cycle signal via jack stat, okay? So that was just kind of a zoom in on the hair follicle. If you were there at noon, you heard this already, but it's nothing, it's good to have these things reinforced, okay? So alopecia areata, what's happening is you get this influx of T cells in and around the follicle. They start signaling interleukin-15, and interferon gamma are really important drivers of inflammation there. They create this positive feedback loop, okay, where on both sides the signaling is happening via JAK-STAT, okay? So all of a sudden we have an opportunity to interfere on both sides of this, of this perpetual positive feedback loop and, and grow hair. Okay, so JAK inhibitors in kids, right now we don't have any FDA approved treatments. There is one medication that has been studied all the way through phase three trials for ritlocitinib. We should hopefully be hearing about that in the next several months. I'm very hopeful it will get approved down to age 12, but we'll see what the FDA says. There's lots of literature now about using off-label JAKs for alopecia areata in kids, primarily tofacitinib, because that was what's been around the longest, and I will just point out that tofacitinib is approved for juvenile arthritis as young as age two, okay? I think when that PD indication for GIA came out, that made me feel a lot better about things, and I think for a lot of kids, alopecia areata can be as debilitating, if not more, than arthritis, right? Kids aren't going to school. They're not, you know, they're suicidal, et cetera, so something to kind of think about in these patients. So. Um, super exciting thing happened in June where baricitinib got approved for alopecia areata, again, in adults, so I'm going to talk about it. Um, some of you may see adults, and hopefully it will be helpful, but um, it is something you might think about using off-label in your, in your adolescent patients if you can get it. So these are just some pictures from the trial. It is, like, really incredible to see these <laughs> patients come in. Not only do they look totally different, but they feel totally different. You will never meet a more grateful patient in your life. Like, it is really, really fun. Um, so this is, um, this is a label for baricitinib. So it's approved for adults. Um, 18 and up who have severe alopecia areata. One thing that's kind of nice about the label is it doesn't specify a percent scalp involvement. So if it's severe in your estimation, then um, you, know, you kind of qualify. What the label says is to start with two milligrams daily, and if a patient doesn't have an adequate response to go up to four milligrams daily, they don't give you any timing for that. However, if a patient has complete or near complete scalp involvement, with or without eyebrow eyelash involvement, you can consider starting with four milligrams daily. I'm gonna tell you um, what I actually do, and then the label says, you know, once you've achieved an adequate response with four milligrams, then you decrease to two milligrams. I'm not actually gonna do those things because again, remember with hair, the stakes are very, very high, right? It's not like something for atopic dermatitis or psoriasis, which if you stop and then they flare, okay, you start them back on it, maybe six, eight, 12 weeks, they're kind of back to where they were before. No, once you start losing hair and alopecia areata, the ship is sailing already. You can't backtrack, number one. And then number two, you have to wait for that hair to come back in. I have patients who've had you know, no hair anywhere. They regrow with a jack inhibitor. They're wearing a wig. It takes them two or three years to actually take off their wig because they don't want to have this huge contrast like, you know, and all this unwanted attention about their pixie cut, okay? So remember that stakes are high with hair. It's really, really different, okay? So in adolescents, people with severe alopecia areata, if I'm able to get this off-label, I, and adults, I would start, I start with four milligrams. Again, that's not what the label says, but why would I make somebody wait three or four months <laughs> to increase it when it takes three or four months at least to start seeing hair growth, right? So I'd rather start high, get them to where they're gonna be, see if it works, and then maybe consider decreasing the dose over time, okay? For AA, I wanna see something by four months or so. Um, in general, I would say scalp responds better, but some people get their brows and lashes first, like, et cetera. Um, and if you think about a taper, I don't do it until someone's had complete regrowth for like a good, eight, 12 plus months, and like with baricitinib, I might do four milligrams a day, four days a week, and then two, three days a week, and do that for like six months, okay? And really, really, really slowly, because again, any intervention you make, it takes a little while to see, you know, what's gonna happen, and then if you go back, you go way back, 
So these are just some examples of adolescents I've treated with JAK inhibitors. Um, these are mostly tofacitinib, but it really um, can transform kids' life. But what about safety? Okay, so I think everybody's excited about JAKs because they do have this really kind of unparalleled potential to help our patients, but I think people are worried, right? There's this box warning, like you have to talk about cancer and cardiovascular events and et cetera, and like, that's a lot, you know? Sometimes when I say all the, I use all the words in my clinic. I use the, I use the word cancer, I use the word death, I use the word, you know, um, blood clots, et cetera. I think it's really important to be open about that. But you see the people look at you and you're like, and I say, yeah, I know, it sounds like a poison, right? Like why would anybody in the world take that? Okay, well, we have to kind of understand where some of those risks come from, okay? so the, AEs that we, you know, commonly reported, we're pretty used to these except for acne. If I have a minute at the end, um, we'll talk about acne or jackne as we're starting to call it. So what does that box say, okay? So this is actually the package insert from jack inhibitor. So even topical jack inhibitor got this language on it, okay? So every jack, well, not do cravacidinib, but otherwise, that's uh, proof for inflammatory skin disease has this box warning, okay? And what you see in all these little labels is this language that says, in a randomized post-marketing safety study of RA patients 50 years of age and older with at least one cardiovascular risk factor, comparing another JAK inhibitor, so that's tofacitinib, okay, not approved for anything in dermatology, um, or skin disease anyways, higher rate of mortality, mace, thrombosis, death, et cetera, was seen. Okay, really quickly, I just wanna show you that study that led to this labeling. So this is called the oral surveillance study. It was in totally different patients um, from what we see. They were older, they were sicker, they were on methotrexate, lots of comorbidities also, okay? And you can see there was a slightly higher rate of these scary things in the tofacitinib group, but not that much higher than the TNF group, okay? And so I think when it comes to our patients, atopic dermatitis, alopecia areata, et cetera, there really aren't rheumatoid arthritis. We're looking at a really different category of patients. I think comorbidities are important. Um, We don't know a ton about the long-term risks, but you know, nevertheless, we have the discussion with our patients. Um, These are some of the things I think about when I think about systemic treatment. Um, And I think in in general, you know, we think we're weighing risk and benefit, benefit, but I think in kids especially, we're often weighing risk with consequences of not treating, okay? So just really quickly, you may see jackne in patients on JAK inhibitors. We're gonna see it more in our teenage patients and the numbers will probably be higher in adolescent trials, but really it's kind of the same as regular old acne. I see it in these sort of different ways, but you treat it just like you would treat um, acne. And this is a kid who had um, jackne and did really well in low dose isotretinoin. Okay, so that is it. <laughs> Very cool. We're going to finish this uh, session on adolescent patients with a talk by Peter Leo, psychosocial effects of skin disease. And after that, we have a a break that we'll take to about 3.20, give it a chance to visit the exhibits and network a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think what's fascinating about the psychosocial concept is that it's sort of why we're here. Uh, Obviously, we, we love the skin, we want the skin to be better, but really what we're treating is the patient, and that's them here, right? Their psychosocial aspect is really the part of them that is actually paying attention to their skin. That's what's bothered by their skin. So this really affects every aspect of dermatology, every aspect of treatment, and is such an important part of what we do. Uh, I think the meditation I like is from one of my clinical heroes, Walter B. Shelley, who said, quote, the therapist walks a tight rope between faith and skepticism, but should he fall, let it be towards faith, unquote. I really like that. You have to take a leap. And sometimes we do go out on a limb for patients, especially because we don't have all the evidence. As we've heard, there's lots coming, but there are many things we still don't know. And there's a, there's a sort of an inherent humility to treating patients uh, that I think we learn quickly. Many of the conditions we treat, especially the inflammatory ones, really have these inflammatory loops. And I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with this. This is the one I want to get a tattoo of somewhere on my body. I'm not sure where yet. But it really, it, it really encapsulates this concept that we have these vicious cycles or loops that patients get trapped in. And one of the most important parts of this loop, this is of course for atopic dermatitis, we see the skin barrier at the 12 o'clock position, we have the microbiome becoming dysbiotic, we have the inflammatory aspect. But then if we look, we have the nerve aspect, and of course that connects to a behavioral component as well. That's an important part of this whole loop. And to get patients out of these, we have to both understand it, and then we can even do some very specific treatments, I think, um, at best. 
the mind-body connection is really powerful. There's this great quote I came across that said, quote, the power of the mind over the body can produce effects which seem almost magical, unquote. And this was Johnson and Barber who wrote this paper. Uh, and what's really remarkable is this was all about using hypnotherapy, hypnotic suggestions. And I think this is true. There can be some, some things that border on magic, things that maybe we are, are not expecting or are understanding. And when we make that connection with a patient, uh, we have many names for this. Sometimes we call it the placebo effect. Sometimes we call it uh, just having confidence in, in the therapeutic person. But when you do that, I think you actually can get better results. And so this is bigger than just showing an easy score of 75 or better. It's, it's bigger than showing a clearance rate. This is about making the patient feel better because we know this affects everything. So for example, in atopic dermatitis, the disease I'm most focused on in my practice, we know that the burden is enormous. There's a huge prevalence, you know, maybe 12, 13, some studies as high as 20% of children, maybe seven to 10% of adults, depending on how you ask. We know the costs are staggering over $5 billion a year. The impact on the quality of life is thought to be the same or even greater than type one diabetes. It's seriously more than just a rash, right? I mean, this really affects people. Of course, it leads to sleep deprivation, social isolation, restricted choices. Many patients, well, I see a pretty extreme group, no doubt, but people can't go to school. We have 504 plans because they can't leave their house. They're miserable. And it, you realize just the tremendous burden of, of just a rash on their skin. And it's, it's pretty hard when people are told that, oh, come on, this is just a skin thing. Get over it. It's like the patient can't get up. They're in big trouble. The psychosocial impact is enormous. 50% of adults with atopic derm report a negative impact on sexual relationships. 40% report a negative impact on social relationships, and almost 40% of kids are teased or bullied because of their atopic dermatitis. And I think it's one of those things, if you don't ask, many of the patients are chipper. Kids are usually in a good mood as a general rule. But if you don't ask, you might not know. And the more I've asked about it, the more I find there's some darkness to all of this. I mean, even if people put on a strong face, they really have it rough. One of the other pieces that's fascinating is that the comorbidities all connect. You know, we know that there are these atopic comorbidities like allergic rhinitis. We know that food allergy is intimately connected with skin barrier problems. But then these other pieces spiral out. So we have our anxiety, our ADHD, depression, stress. And then that can lead to other things like smoking or other behaviors and probably this chronic inflammatory state that puts these patients maybe at a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and even cancer. Now, those studies, I think, get a little bit strange. You know, they kind of are tenuous, but I still think there's something to this. These patients are generally unwell, and that's important to know. All of these different mental health disorders, I think, are pretty much beyond, beyond arguing, at least associated. Now, the magnitude, it may vary from study to study, but patients with atopic dermatitis were 44% more likely to exhibit suicidal ideation and 36% more likely to attempt suicide compared to patients without AD. I mean, if that doesn't speak volumes, I don't know what does. Beyond this, we know that there's a huge burden of itch, both in adults and adolescents and kids. And of course, the adolescents really bridge that gap. And they're so difficult because they can have the best of both worlds and the worst of both worlds from the younger kids and the adults. And here, of course, we know that the burden of itch is enormous. Most people report that they have daily itch. And many people report that it is unbelievable or unbearing, unbearable itch in terms of the severity, almost 70% in this adult AD survey. Of course, the sleep disturbances affect all ages, and they don't just affect the patient, right? They affect the whole family. So the number one thing that I see in my office is everybody has bags under their eyes. Everybody is strung out, exhausted, and mean. I have a lot of mean patients. When I walk in them, they're angry, and I can diffuse them. You know, I got to put on the charm and settle them out, and I'm listening. And by the end, there's a lot of tears, and people apologize, but it's, I know they've had a rough time. And I'm like, I understand. You've had a rough, you're at your worst. You haven't slept in sometimes years. Your skin is miserable. You can't concentrate. Everything's falling apart and everyone keeps giving you a prescription for triamcinolone and saying, just use this, you'll get better. It's like they're going crazy, right? Of course, uh, the anxiety and depression may be also independently related to the sleep depth. So we, it's hard to separate these things. Is it their skin that's driving them crazy? Is it the fact that they're not sleeping? Yes, it's all of the above, probably. And the sleep disturbance is fascinating. There are probably multiple factors that affect it. This was a neat figure that I, I wanted to share where they talk about, of course, there's the fact that you're itchy, so you're scratching all night, so sleep quality is poor. But we also know that there are probably circadian rhythm issues from the inflammation in the body and the transepidermal water loss. It's affecting things. There's cytokines that are involved, of course, in inflammation and barrier, like IL-4 and IL-13 that we've heard about, but they also play a role in, in cytokine regulation of sleep and some of the mental processes. So there may be some 
this concept of inflammation driving depression, inflammation driving sleep abnormalities. This might be onto something. And of course, the environmental factors, allergens, irritants, and light, all of these things play in and makes it really tough to get patients better. Now, I focused a lot on atopic dermatitis, but that's not the only disease where this is really important. There are huge morbidities to other aspects uh, of dermatology, and we just heard about alopecia areata not too long ago that this is another disease that is associated with many different comorbidities, from the autoimmune friends that come along with it, like RA, multiple sclerosis, type 1 diabetes, psoriasis, these are, have a higher association with having alopecia areata. Not very high. I don't think we have to screen all of our patients for these, but there's something up with their immune system. Uh, inflammatory and metabolic issues like allergic rhinitis, dip, dyslipidemia, neuropsychiatric things, again, anxiety and depression, raise their head again, and it's hard to know, chicken or egg, is this an inflammatory problem causing this, or is this because they feel all the self-consciousness and all the stress around their condition and even cardiovascular things. So we hear a very similar set of things, but especially that neuropsychiatric, I think, is, is worth looking at. Depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorder. And of course, acne has a huge set of comorbidities that we know, and again, why patients come in to be treated, because there is a very powerful connection between acne and depression. And of course, uh, isotretinoin was thrown under the bus for a long time as being one of the causes of, of people committing suicide, but now I think the evidence is pretty convincing that it, it probably is not isotretinoin, that you can actually separate this out. Acne itself probably is the biggest driver, and of course there are some other independent ones with oral antibiotics too, so the whole thing is kind of a messy story, but we're in a very, very complex background of people with lots of issues, especially those severe enough to warrant treatment with isotretinoin. They're, they're often the ones who are having the biggest impact on their mental health. So very difficult to, to dissociate these things, but really, really important. In fact, the most recent study I could find showed isotretinoin actually being associated with improvements in anxiety and depression. And that's, that's what I see clinically. Patients who are really miserable, they're upset about their skin, they're frazzled. By the end, they're saying, wow, this is great. And you know, the number one thing people say is, why didn't we start with this, right? And it's like, well, we have to be careful. We don't wanna use the biggest, biggest tools in the toolbox right away. Now, this is something I think is fascinating. There are these wonderful studies that show when people are stressed, so just psychological stress, you actually can show increase in some of the inflammatory cytokines directly, and you can also show a direct change in the skin barrier. They actually become functionally leaky skin when you, act, when you have stress. So this was it showing that it can slow healing of the skin barrier for patients who are sleep deprived or stressed. And then sleep depriva deprivation by itself disrupts skin barrier function in healthy patients. So imagine what this does in people that have already existing skin barrier damage or impairment, either from the disease itself or from some of the treatments that we're using. So what do we find? I think our goal is to get these things under control and get them under control stably. And we go from that vicious cycle to the virtuous cycle. Everything starts getting better. The inflammation pattern of up and down and up and down stops. The skin barrier can heal. The microbiome starts to normalize. That's sort of the elephant in the room. What is the microbiome's role? It's probably gigantic, right? The more we learn about the microbiome, the more we realize that we were only telling part of the story for the entire history of medicine. This is our extra organ that's hanging out in our body. It outnumbers us. And here we are, we barely know what to do with it. And that may be the answer for a lot of these questions that we still have. So hypnosis is one of the ways we can approach this. We can actually get patients to a better state and control this stress component or anxiety component. And we don't fully understand how it works. It's kind of a mysterious thing. Some people roll their eyes at it, but I think there is actually some reasonably good evidence that it may actually help. And I use this a lot in my practice. I refer out, I have a hypnotherapist that I work with closely and she's fantastic. It's all virtual. It's very, very inexpensive. It's affordable for most patients because there are a couple of visits and then she gives them a recording that they can do over and over on their own. So it's not even that they have to do visit after visit after visit. You know, a few visits, they get the recordings and I've seen dramatic improvement, especially with some of the behavioral pieces and the anxiety pieces. And that's something that can fuel things if they're scratching and rubbing. Uh, this was really neat that we know it affects not only the autonomic nervous system, I think that's not a stretch, but that it directly affects the immune system and directly affects the skin barrier. And again, probably this is due to the fact that it's working through some of these stress-mediated pathways. Really cool. I think that for patients that are having trouble, this can be a wonderful thing we can keep in our pocket. It may take some time and energy, but I do think it's, it's something that we underutilize. 
The other close cousin of hypnosis is mindfulness psychotherapy, and there are some of these techniques that some of them can even border on cognitive behavioral therapy or habit reversal therapy. So there's a whole literature on these, but these are fantastic. And we know that after some of these interventions, and this one they're looking at hypnosis in particular, they found improvements on psychological well-being, mental quality of life, and dermatology quality of life index scales. So again, I, I just think it's so important if we can utilize this for some of these conditions as an adjunct. And I always tell my patients. I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm not saying it's in your head, but I think that it's causing a lot of stress to you and we know that can make things worse. So if you could do something like this, maybe it doesn't have to be formal hypnosis. Maybe it's relaxation therapy. Maybe it's even one of those apps that can really help break some of these cycles. At the very least, we know that hypnosis leads to not only improvement in itch, but an improvement in sleep. So that's another angle in for my AD patients. I'll say, I know you're having so much trouble sleeping. Maybe we've tried a bunch of things. Uh, we're working on your skin condition, but can we do this? And I think that's another great role for hypnotherapy. It's underutilized in that point. And in fact, this actually, in this study, they found that hypnotherapy helped not only with itch, but also with sleep and persisted 18 months after the treatment in the majority of the patients. So it durable long-term effect. I think patients learn how to control some of that. It's, it's some really nice tools. Another study here uh, found that it wasn't superior between hypnosis or biofeedback, and that suggests that there are multiple ways to approach this. If hypnosis seems too out there, biofeedback is another approach, and many behavioral therapists will have access to this. This again, this can be even covered by insurance. So I'm always looking for ways. And currently I'm working with a really neat psychologist from Mass General Hospital on doing an app because some of these techniques are so simple, they don't even really need a clinician. They're just little, little behavioral tactics they can do. So we're working on something that could be free that would go through the National Eczema Association that they could just do themselves. Maybe it's a little video, maybe there's one of those like the Headspace app or one of those where you can do these little exercises that makes it more available to everybody. So psoriasis as well. We know that emotional triggers can, can fire it up and stress makes it worse. Educational programs really can help. That's the other piece. Good education and support. We run a support group for National Eczema Association in Chicago, but now it's virtual. It's been virtual since the pandemic, and we're going to keep it that way because people tune in from all over. That kind of patient support is another thing I think we can do, and there is pretty good evidence to support this, not only in terms of understanding, but also in terms of literal outcomes. People do better when they understand more and when they have each other to talk to. And the last piece is a study we did looking at a written action plan, writing it out for the patient giving them that sense of empowerment. I think that's such a wonderful way our patients reported that it was so much better than just being told verbally what to do. They felt like they understood it better. They felt like they understood the safety better. And of course, this is really key in patients that are nervous about things, like steroid phobic patients or patients that have a lot of concerns about using systemic agents. We just heard, you know, uh, an expert, uh, it, Dr. Craiglow is amazing at her jack inhibitors, but many patients are freaked out as soon as you talk about the black box warning. So these are also techniques that we can use to get through them. We can make our shared decision-making processes to get over some of these, these big hurdles. In some, these skin conditions have a huge and terrible outcome for these patients and their families, but there's so many things that we can do. And I think, uh, as Hippocrates once said in his aphorisms, life is short and art long, opportunity fleeting, experimentation perilous, and judgment difficult. Thank you so much. Thank you.